Nature is made possible by public television stations, your gas company, and America's natural gas industry. Developing new ways to use clean gas energy to generate electricity and fuel vehicles to help meet America's goal for cleaner air. And by Siemens, a leader in electronics and electrical engineering. 27,000 employees, 47 manufacturing facilities. The name is Siemens. This is Heron Island, off the Queensland coast of Australia. Hi, I'm George Page for Nature, and here we are literally on the Tropic of Capricorn. But more importantly, this tiny island is at the southern end of Australia's Great Barrier Reef, a living system so large that it's actually visible from outer space. From this point, it stretches 1,200 miles north to the Gulf of Papua. And although it's been cursed by mariners from Captain Cook on, it's one of the great wonders of the natural world. It supports an explosion of marine life. And believe me, it's a paradise for snorkelers and scuba divers. Australians are justly proud of it. In geological terms, the Great Barrier Reef is a relative newcomer to Australia's 17,000-mile coastline because this continent is slowly moving northward. Millions of years ago, it lay in much colder waters to the south, too cold for coral reef. As we continue our exploration of the nature of Australia, we look this time at the marine life that surrounds this country. We start our story in the seas off the southern coasts, a place dominated by the winds of the roaring 40s and the chilled currents from Antarctica. A vivid contrast to these calm, clear tropical waters. The wild seas that lash Australia's southern coast are driven by the roaring 40s, the mighty winds that race all the way around the globe at these latitudes. These surging waves bring food and oxygen to sustain the plants and animals which flourish in these southern waters. The force of the wind and sea shapes the nature of Australia's marine life and carves the wild splendor of the continent's southern edge. That force is generated a long way to the south, 1,200 miles away in the Antarctic. What happens in this icy wilderness sets the pattern for conditions in the seas surrounding Australia. The cold air sliding down the high Antarctic plateau primes the great engine 
which runs all the weather and current systems of the Southern Hemisphere. And the Antarctic's icy waters underwrite the very life of Australia's seas, the source of their essential nutrients. The process begins when the sea ice breaks up after the long polar winter and the returning sun stimulates a burst of growth. The warming surface waters expand and move offshore, replaced by cold waters welling up from the deep. Minerals and nutrients are brought to the surface, which together with sunlight, fuel vast blooms of algae that become food for great swarms of tiny crustaceans. Some of this wealth eventually flows to Australia's seas, weaving through a complex web of animal life, from these krill to seals and whales. Most seals, like this Weddell, hunt fish and squid, but some eat penguins too. Surviving here requires a great deal of energy. These penguins must catch enough fish and krill to keep their chicks growing strong in the short summer. The penguins seek safety in numbers. They leave and enter the water together because leopard seals lurk nearby, waiting to snatch a lone or unwary bird. The wealth of nutrients flows from the Antarctic to Australia through a complex system of currents. Their origins go back 150 million years, when all the southern continents were locked together. As this great landmass broke apart, the oceans were set moving in new patterns. Australia broke away 50 million years ago and moved north. Antarctica encircled by cool currents, iced over. Where the circumpolar current meets the warmer temperate oceans, there's rich feeding for many seabirds before the cold water sinks, taking its cargo of nutrients with it. Far below the surface, slow currents move the rich water northward along the ocean floor. It may take a thousand years, but eventually the currents rise on the slopes of Australia's continental shelf and enrich the local waters. Nutrients ferried in all the way from the Antarctic support great forests of kelp and a marvelous diversity of marine life. In more sheltered waters, corrugated leaves of string kelp create their own small eddies to extract food from the passing currents. Tiny crustaceans live on and around these towering plants and fall prey to pipefishes and seahorses.
Its markings blend in beautifully with the foliage. But in another member of the family, camouflage has reached perfection. This bizarre creature has come to resemble the seaweeds that are its home. The disguise protects the leafy sea dragon from its enemies, and it's also useful for stalking its own prey of small shrimps. The great variety of life in and around the kelp forests culminates in the ultimate predators, sharks. But hunting uses up a great deal of energy, and these gray nurse sharks spend the days resting in deep channels, circling slowly to let the water bring oxygen to their gills. Channels team with other fish. They're safe for now, but come nightfall, the gray nurses will go on patrol. Fish have many ways to evade the snapping jaws. These leather jackets have poisonous spines, which they erect in the face of danger. Reproduction represents a special challenge in these turbulent waters where unprotected eggs are scattered far and wide. Many animals solve the problem by guarding their eggs till the young inside are well developed. For the blue-ringed octopus, the process begins with a remarkable mating. Though among the most venomous of sea creatures, they pose no threat to each other. After a brief chase, she submits to the probe of an arm modified into the male's sexual organ. With the other arms holding her, it searches out the female's mantle cavity and finally penetrates it. Now comes the extraordinary part of this strange coupling. The sperm is wrapped in a transparent tube-like package and muscle contractions send it along a special groove in the arm. The pressure of seawater forces the sperm out of the packet into the female egg chamber. After the eggs form, she keeps them within her body's embrace until they hatch into well-developed young. The sea dragons also keep their eggs safe, but in their case, it's the males that do the carrying. The youngsters are nurtured in tiny pouches flanking his tail, more than 200 of them. Now, they're about to break free, tail first. They soon grow large enough to escape the legions of predators that eat small things and are able to swim and fend for themselves. The need to give their young a good start in life brings other animals into the coastal waters of southern Australia. These are the favored breeding places of the southern right whales. The water is warmer here than in the sub-Antarctic where they've spent the summer feeding. And in winter, they come here to mate and give birth.
When the whales arrive, they're well fed and ready for courting. And this young bull is on the trail of a likely mate. Much time and energy goes into breeding, and the rituals of courtship and competition often explode into boisterous displays. These powerful giants show great tenderness when playing with their newborn calves. The close bond between mother and calf is essential to its survival. She provides both food and protection for the first two years of its life. When it's born, the calf seeks out the mother's nipples almost immediately. Whale milk is extremely rich, and the youngster doubles its weight in the first few weeks. The calf must grow big and strong quickly, because by the end of winter, it has to follow its mother on the long journey back to the polar seas. While the whales make their way south, other marine mammals gather to breed. The Australian fur seals come to a few favored places, and their concentrations attract the ocean's fiercest predator, the great white shark. The great white is a supremely designed killer. It grows to a streamlined 23 feet, and its battery of detectors homes in on the vibrations and electrical impulses sent out by prey. It relies on speed and surprise, for once the shark's been spotted, a swift and agile seal has no trouble evading the mighty jaws. With sharks patrolling the water, the seals retreat to shore to have their young. And where the sea breaks the coast into rock ledges and pools, the seals establish their colony. The bulls compete for prime sites. The key to breeding success is a territory where cows pass by most frequently. The losers end up away from the female traffic with less chance to breed. About 5,000 animals jostle for space, and the colony grows day by day, for the cows are now giving birth to the pups conceived the year before. This is a difficult birth the pups emerging flippers first.
The pup remains partially wrapped in the birth membrane, and its head needs to be freed before it can draw its first breath. While silver gulls squabble over the afterbirth, the cow is intent on her newborn's first attempts at suckling. After a few days, she'll mate again and leave her young for short periods while she goes back to the sea to feed. When the breeding season ends, so does the need to guard territory, and the bulls, too, return to the sea. The Southern Ocean brings in the food on which all life here depends. And it is the richness of these waters that gives a special character to the marine life fringing Australia's southern coasts. Ironically, the warmer waters to Australia's north provide far fewer nutrients, and that's given rise to a very different marine world. About 20 million years ago, Australia's northward drift took it into the tropical latitudes. As the continent thrust its way toward the equator, islands rose, diverting some of the equatorial currents along the eastern coast of Australia. With the currents came new forms of life, among them the seeds of mangroves. Mangroves are trees that tolerate salt water and can grow in mud devoid of oxygen. But they do need oxygen and so they raise their roots from the mud to expose them to the air at low tide. The tangled roots trap the rich silt carried down by the rivers, and whelks and mud creepers sift through it for microscopic particles of food. While the tide is out, armies of soldier crabs march across the flats. Unlike other crabs, which scuttle sideways, soldiers move forward, scooping up silt to filter through their mouthparts. The rising water warns the soldiers to burrow into the mud and escape the predators coming in on the flood tide. At high water, the tidal forest provides rich pickings for many animals. Sea urchins move onto the mangrove roots and scrape the algae with their sharp beaks. The Cassiopeia jellyfish has algae actually growing within its tissue. It lives upside down to expose them to the sunlight, enabling them to produce energy. The mangrove roots become anchoring points for even stranger creatures. They look like lumps of rock, but they are in fact living corals, animals encased in limestone. This might well be how the first corals colonized Australian waters 18 million years ago. Sunlight is essential to the corals' growth. The clearer the water, the more limestone they produce, enough eventually to make mighty reefs. The reefs grow and die with the rise and fall of the seas. The latest growth began only 8,000 years ago, yet it's created the greatest series of reefs on Earth. The Great Barrier Reef, stretching for more than 1,200 miles along the coast of northeastern Australia. It's the power of the sun that enables this enormous living structure to flourish in waters that are almost nutritional deserts. 
The whole system is designed to make the most of what little the sea does provide. It begins with the reef's outer edge, shaped to absorb the power of the waves and to channel the water's few precious nutrients. The corals and fish on the outer edge get first call on the new supplies. And this is where there's the strongest growth, the most diversity, and the fiercest turbulence. The tides flow through the channels to the rest of the reef carrying nutrients for coral animals and the ingredients for the limestone that binds the corals into reefs. In the calmer waters of the back reef, corals fan out into staghorns and huge plates to catch as much sunlight as possible. More than 2,000 kinds of fish live here, and the reefs harbor myriads of other creatures, and just as many ways of finding food. This little porcelain crab lives within the shelter of an anemone, and its mouthparts have become modified into a delicate net to catch food floating by. Nearby, another crab crops the seaweeds growing on its shell. Seaweeds and algae are the reef's primary producers. They convert the nutrients carried in by the tides into food for many animals. Some damselfish even cultivate their own patch of algae and weed out less tasty plants to promote the growth of their favorites. Butterfly fishes have different mouth shapes, each tailored to a particular kind of food. Some have flattened mouths to pinch off the fleshy tips of these rounded types of coral, while long snouts can probe into crevices for tiny crustaceans. While corals are eaten by many creatures, they themselves are predators too. These tentacles are put out by coral polyps, each a single animal, together a mighty colony. Their deadly arms are tipped with stinging cells to pierce and paralyze any small creatures that float within reach. Once stung, there's no escape, and the tentacles pass the victim to the polyp's mouth. Plankton supplies only part of the energy reef corals need. Sunlight provides the rest. To harness the sun's power, corals enter a remarkable partnership with algae that live inside the coral tissue. Through photosynthesis, algae provide oxygen and nourishment for the corals to build into limestone, and the algae get the nutrients they need from the coral's waste. The more sun they get, the faster corals grow. But too much sun can be fatal. Very low tides leave some reef tops exposed, and the corals that live here have a kind of suntan lotion in their tissues to screen out the deadly ultraviolet rays. They also secrete a mucus to stop them from drying out.
When the tide returns, the mucus is washed away and becomes part of the food supplies ferried by the currents. The reefs form an almost self-sustaining society in which everything is recycled and nothing goes to waste. It's crowded with life, yet it's a dangerous world where the need for protection has produced defenses of every sort. Color warns other creatures that this nudibranch is poisonous. Another nudibranch sports a coat of vivid leaves loaded with evil tasting glands. Sophisticated camouflage of color and shape blends the lionfish into the coral rock. And elaborate strategies have been devised to ensure the survival of young. Among these small damselfish, it's the males that prepare the nests. This one's leading a potential mate down to the place he's made ready. She lays down strings of transparent eggs. He follows with his sperm to cover them, and in the days that follow, he'll protect them from the reef's many hungry mouths. Once they hatch, the young are usually on their own. But the black and white damsel takes parenting one step further. It guards its brood, like a hen with its chicks, until they've outgrown some of their enemies. But eggs are eagerly sought after, and there are as many ways to protect them as there are fish on the reef. The stinging tentacles of the anemone give clownfish ready-made protection. These fish spend their lives in the arms of a single anemone. Males and females work together to prepare the nest site. She lays her golden brood. Then he sheds his sperm over them. After an hour or so, the female makes her last pass, and 400 eggs are waiting to hatch. From now on, the male will tend the brood and get rid of any infected or infertile eggs. Among cardinal fish, male care goes a remarkable step further. It's his mouth that becomes the nest. The pair swim side by side. Then suddenly, she releases her eggs in a sticky ball. For a moment, it hangs while his sperm covers them. Then he takes it into his mouth, not to eat, but to incubate. Occasionally, he half spits the eggs out, but only so that the water can supply fresh oxygen. There are obvious drawbacks to a mouthful of eggs, and pipefish have come up with another solution. Their mating dance is the prelude to a male pregnancy that's even more astonishing. The dance serves to synchronize the reproductive cycle, and by the time the partners rise into the water, the female's sexual organ has become clearly visible. Finally, with a motion so swift it almost defeats the eye, she sweeps a sheet of eggs into the pouch on the male's belly.
Now the dance changes to a wiggle. The male presses his pouch against his partner's body to settle the egg securely in place. Out on the sandy flats, a more robust ritual. Male triggerfish put their breeding effort into building large nests and keeping rivals away. The powerful mouth shifts lumps of coral rubble into a pile to form an egg chamber, and he blows the sand away so the eggs will have a clean surface to stick to. The chamber's at the center of a hole he's dug out. It's saucer-shaped and several yards across. The sand keeps washing back and constantly needs to be scooped out again. But at least one eye is always kept out for trespassers. Small fish may eat the eggs, but it's the appearance of a rival male that provokes the most aggressive response. It's now the entire nesting domain that's at stake. Hours of mouth-to-mouth -mouth combat leave the lips in shreds, but a final charge sends the intruder into retreat. When the moon is in the first quarter, females arrive high above the breeding colony, and each male tries to lure as many as he can to inspect his nest. With so many to choose from, she can afford to be particular, and it takes all his powers of persuasion to lead her down. Courtship begins at dusk. If all goes well, she'll lay her eggs in his nest at dawn. Daylight reveals the eggs clustered in the nest. Her mate keeps watch and she tends to them until they hatch that night. The life of the reef is ruled by the sun and tides. Many reef creatures time their breeding so their eggs hatch at night and disperse on an outgoing tide. There are fewer hungry mouths then, because the daytime fish are preparing for sleep, some in cocoons of their own making. Soon after dusk, ten days after the eggs were laid onto his body, the male pipefish goes into labor. Some of the hatchlings begin to emerge from his pouch. Although tiny and transparent, they're well developed. With a vigorous shake, he releases the rest of his brood. The eggs of the triggerfish are also stirring in their coral nest.
Moments later, the hatchlings burst free, all together, so their numbers will overwhelm any predators. By daylight, the currents have carried the larvae far away from the Great Barrier Reef, out to the relative safety of the open sea. Now other fishes are preparing to spawn, gathering in a channel on the outer reef where the water flows most strongly. They too time their breeding to the tides, but in a very different way. Instead of guarding their eggs till they hatch, these parrotfish will release them directly into the water. To prepare for that moment, the largest males mark out territories to court females and fight off rivals. The battle is brief, for time is short. The tide is turning, and a female needs to be found before the rush to spawn. As the spawning pairs rise high up into the current, smaller males, unable to hold their own territories, rush in to join them. In unison, they eject the eggs and sperm, like puffs of white smoke, to mingle and fertilize in the open water. Schools of fusiliers dart in to feast on the spawn before it disperses. But there's so much that many of the eggs escape on the tide. Every ebb tide in summer carries out great quantities of eggs and larvae to hatch and grow in the vastness of the open ocean. Sheer numbers are the key to success, for even away from the reef, there's risk. Whale sharks cruise these waters. At up to 60 feet long and weighing 15 tons, they are the largest fish in the sea. Their huge bulk is sustained by the plankton swept into the cavernous mouth. Plankton of which fish eggs and larvae often make up the largest part. The manta ray, another specialized plankton feeder. Its head has evolved into a twin scoop. Despite their vast appetite, it's not these giants that pose the greatest threat to the young fish but the risk of starvation, because the open ocean is like a desert and has little food for growing young fish. Occasionally, the currents come to the aid of some fry, and they find shelter and food within the fronds of jellyfish. Of the myriad sent out to sea, only a few will survive to be carried back to the reef to replenish their kind. Sometimes chance favors a species and the larvae find more food or suffer less predation. For a time, that species dominates its patch of reef. The assortment of fishes is an ever-changing kaleidoscope. Some fish increase their chances by having their young look like something else. This juvenile resembles a distasteful flatworm, nothing like the tasty batfish it will be when it grows up. Flowing through all the different ways of reproducing are the tides and the currents. The flow is especially important to the corals themselves, for they can't go in search of partners. The water becomes their go-between, 
in one of the rarest spectacles on Earth. In November, when the waters warm, a few nights after the full moon, the corals of the Great Barrier Reef prepare to give birth. Up and down the length of the Great Reef, eggs and sperm wrapped together in tiny bundles are pushed out through billions of coral mouths. Corals many hundreds of miles apart spawn almost simultaneously, a mass ejaculation cued by the moon and the temperature of the water. Nearly every kind of coral joins in. Most have the female and male cells wrapped together. Some polyps are single sex and release clouds of either sperm or eggs. For a few hours, the coral seas are a swirl with blizzards of reproductive cells. Long, worm-like shapes snake through the clouds to join in the synchronized frenzy to spawn. They are strings of eggs and sperm from the palolo worm that peel off to join the throng. There are predators too, but the sheer volume ensures that enough eggs and sperm reach the surface to fertilize. The packages break up once they're near the surface, and the sperms are set free to seek out and fertilize the eggs. Somehow, possibly following a trail of chemical clues, the minute sperms manage to find the right eggs. They burrow inside, and minutes later, the fertilized egg cells begin to divide. Soon, a coral larva takes shape, still only a millimeter or so long. Yet from these tiny beginnings, mighty reefs grow. But there is no birth and growth without decay and destruction on the reef as elsewhere. Among the more visible destroyers are the hump-headed parrotfish. Their teeth have become fused into strong shearing blades that bite off whole chunks of coral. They grind the coral into a paste extract the living tissue and void the sandy waste in ribbons through the water. Waves and currents mold the coral sand and in places begin to heap it up, eventually to emerge above the water as coral caves. Some of the islands become the beachhead for a remarkable invasion from oceans far away. Early in December, giant green turtles approach the islands, massive animals of a quarter of a ton and a yard across. Most are females, heavy with eggs. Their ancestors have been roaming the seas for a hundred million years. The seas have changed, shores have come and gone, but the turtles' breeding continues in its ancient pattern.
In this summer of peak numbers, 10,000 turtles come ashore here every night, and space is at a premium. Each turtle is concerned only with its own offspring, and some dig their nests where other clutches have already been buried, indifferent to the fate of those earlier broods. Many eggs are destroyed. The season's early hatchlings are easy prey. The baby turtles are widely scattered, and the rufous night herons take their pick. Dawn finds the turtle legions making their slow way back to the sea. But it's low tide, and they're left all but stranded on the reef flat. It'll be mid-morning before the returning tide comes to their rescue. Some of the older, weaker ones barely make it to the water's edge and perish soon after they get there. As the tide rises, it carries away the casualties. Tiger sharks have been waiting. They seldom attack healthy turtles, but scavenge disabled and dead ones. The scent of blood brings other sharks, and the water churns with a frenzy of snapping jaws. In order to break open the tough shell, the shark twists, bringing his teeth into full play. While the sharks feed, the new generation of turtles stirs in the sand. About six weeks after the eggs were laid, the hatchlings greet the world. This time, the entire brood bursts out together, their numbers overwhelming the waiting predators. Instinct drives the hatchlings to the sea. Many will make it, for such an abundance of food is too much for the herons. Where they go, no one knows. They vanish into the vastness of the ocean as they've done since long before Australia became a continent. When they reach breeding age in 40 years, some will return, riding the tides and currents that govern all the life of the sea and ultimately that of the plants and animals on the island continent itself. In our next program, we look at the Australian bush and the animals that make their home there. None of them more famous than...
than the koala. Almost as much a symbol of Australia today as the kangaroo. So join us next time as we continue to explore the nature of Australia. I'm George Page. Nature is made possible by public television stations. By Siemens, a leader in high technology electronics and electrical engineering. Nationwide, 27,000 Americans in 400 locations. The name is Siemens. And by your gas company and America's gas industry, developing ways to use gas more efficiently for more than 160 million people across America. The Nature of Australia is available as a boxed video set. You may order the complete six-part television series on three long-playing video cassettes for $49.95. For credit card orders, please call 1-800-451-7020. The companion book to The Nature of Australia explains how the continent's climate and geography have produced so many unusual species. It also describes modern Australians' efforts to recreate a harmonious relationship with their country's wildlife. This 300-page hardbound volume with over 250 color illustrations is available for $29.95. For credit card orders, please call 1-800-451-7020.